Vitaimo, which means welcome. Um, welcome to St. Paul's. This is really loud, so I'm going to take the microphone a little bit further away from me here. Um, welcome to St. Paul's for a very special event. Uh, my name is Mark Hitchko. I'm the music director here at St. Paul's um, and also the artistic director of the Steeple Concert Series. And I know many of you have come to a lot of the great concerts that are here for the Steeple Concerts. Uh, but today I am here in a different capacity. I'm here as a Ukrainian um, looking for a way to support my, uh, my cultural heritage. Um, and I know that's why you're all here as well. So um, I, just a quick couple of notes about how this event came to be. Um, Yuri has been active as a, uh, a Kobzad, a Ukrainian singer. He'll tell you all about that. I won't get into the details. But, um, and he's been posting on Facebook for a long time about his work. And so I had followed him on Facebook. Um, and about uh, four or five months ago, I started seeing all the things he was doing. And then, of course, when the war broke out, um, I was watching Yuri's amazing videos in the eastern part of Ukraine and some of the incredible things that he was witnessing and his incredible courage and strength for being there and performing in situations that were very dire. Um, so he announced that he was going to be coming to the United States for a pre-existing plan to, to do a tour of the U.S. And I reached out to say, hey, are you going to be performing anywhere in, in New Jersey? Because I'd love to come and see you. Uh, he said, actually, no, no one's reached out to, to book anything in New Jersey. Why, do you know anyone? <laughs> As it happens. <laughs> so, so that's the reason that Yudi is actually here today. So it's a real pleasure. Uh, just a quick note. Um, he called me at about 8 o'clock this morning like this. Marco. He barely had a voice. Um, so Yuri is here on, on uh, the, the good graces uh, and the fortitude that Ukrainians have, as you can all see the way. Uh, he, is, he is fighting through this, um, barely has a voice, but did go to a doctor to get uh, steroid injections, and, and he's, I think, going to be able to at least muscle his way through tonight. But I will just say in advance, it's going to be a lot less singing and more talking and performing. Um, and that's great, because we will be just appreciative of anything that Yudi says. Um, just a couple of other quick notes. Um, if you haven't uh, uh, done so already, please know that this is a free, do uh, free event, um, but we're, we're using this as an opportunity to raise money for humanitarian relief efforts in Ukraine. And specifically, the money that we raise today is going to an organization called Razom, Razom for Ukraine. <clears throat> Razom means together in Ukrainian, um, and it's a Ukrainian-American organization that has been really spearheading a lot of the work that is going on in, in Ukraine, providing humanitarian relief efforts. So I do want to encourage you to give generously, uh, because it is for a good cause. Um, and those of you who are online, welcome and thank you for being here as well. Um, you can also uh, donate today. Any donations that are made online today through the Steeple Concerts website, and our friend Mike, who's working the sound booth right now, will drop that link. Any donations that are received today will also be earmarked for this fundraiser. How do I donate? How, what am I writing a check to? I'd like to write a big check. I have lots of, lots of zeros I want to add to this check. Please make it out to St. Paul's Church, and in the memo, please notate Ukraine, okay? So we want to make sure that if you're donating, donate it to St. Paul's and just make the memo line Ukraine, and any money that we receive with those checks will be set aside and, and, uh, and forwarded along to Razom. You can also write a check directly to Razom if you don't have your checkbook with you today and you want to go home and you want to go into Razom for Ukraine.org, you'll see a big Donate Now button and you can just click on that and, and make a direct donation there. Um, so however you best feel to do it, we want to encourage you because we really want to make sure that we raise as much as we can for the horrific situation that's over there. I think that's about everything I can think of right now, but I just want to say thank you for being here, um, and of course, thanks to Yudi for being here. I already see a question. You asked how the cell phones Ah, yes, okay. Yes, do take a moment, turn off your cell phones and um, beepers. I said this at the last event. If you have a beeper, please throw it out, go buy a cell phone, come back, and then turn it off. Um, so. 
But anyway, uh, thank you for being here, and uh, I should let you know one more note. Um, today we have an additional guest. Uh, Jing is a, a reporter from the Christian Science Monitor, and he's actually doing a documentary on Yuri, and has been following and shadowing Yuri uh, over the last couple of days uh, to create a video docu uh, documentary on this. So he will be recording this performance and incorporating some of the footage that we are doing online as well. So uh, that's why you'll see him kind of walking around, and that's an exciting thing that that level of interest is going on in the work that Yudi is doing. So thank you, Jing, for being here. Um, and of course, thank you all for being here. So without me talking any further, because if I do, I'm going to ask for more donations, um, I want to turn this over to Yudi. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jing, and thank you, everybody. As you can tell, I have no voice. And you know what? Uh, what, a, what a terrible situation. You know, I'm, I'm a singer. Uh, I love to sing. I love to play my music. I love to kobzar, the verb to, to practice this tradition. But to come without my voice, I mean, this is a big tragedy. And I want to start by talking about this. There's a special event today because I can't sing, right? But I had a conversation uh, with uh, Ruslana, who I was staying with, her and her husband in, in Jenkinstown, Philadelphia. And she says, Yuri, I have some information for you. I was at church this Sunday, and I had a very mystical experience where I was up there with God, and I looked down onto earth, and I saw a little speck of, of, of sand, a little black you know, speck. And that was a disease. And the disease was so insignificant because I was with God that uh, uh, I wasn't worried about disease or viruses or things. Uh, and she told me that this morning. And Jing was with me, he remembers. Uh, that was the information I needed uh, to do today's event. Right? I thought, certainly I'll cancel it. There's no way. You know, I can even, even not just sing, but talk. Right? Your vocal cords, you need them to talk, not just sing. You can tell my voice is in bad shape. Uh, but uh, why that's important? Because what the Kobzars did was, yes, certainly they would sing spiritual songs uh, on the accompaniment of the Bandura or the Kobza. This is a Torban. It's not a Kobzar instrument. There was only one Kobzar who played the Torban. That was a uh, Musi Vernihora, a very special uh, prophet in the Kobzar tradition. And I'll share his prophecies with you. But uh, what the Kobzars really did, uh, they didn't have to necessarily sing. Uh, I can talk to you for hours. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you ahead and uh, just, you know, in advance that I'm not going to sing, probably. But I had an injection from the best doctor, vocal doctor in the country. We just happened to be two hours away. Uh, we actually didn't make it in time, so he referred us to his friend at the Mount Sinai Hospital. He gave me the steroid, uh, and my voice is getting better minute by minute. I might even be able to sing. I'm not gonna promise. <laughs> it probably won't happen. He actually put a camera into my vocal cords to see what they looked like. They didn't look good. And why, why did this happen? I've been doing this for five years, right? Daily concerts around the world, mostly the Western world, Canada, uh, United States, Ukraine, Europe. But I got a virus. It's not the coronavirus, I hope. I had a test yesterday. Uh, but the virus, it didn't give me a lot of you know, congestion. It didn't make my head hurt or not much of a temperature. It attacked my throat. So. Through five years of giving these Kobzar concerts, you might say, or events, I never get sick. You might say, that's very strange. You see thousands of people everywhere. Why don't you get sick? Because when I'm in tour, I'm convinced God doesn't let me get sick. Because if I get sick, I lose my voice, and that's in the tour, right? So what's happening now? This is like the best tour. This, this, this past 45 days, mostly the Northeast, why didn't God keep me well? <laughs> uh, I think God wanted something special for you, 
and for me. What I do is training. I'm doing research who the Kobzars were, what the Kobzars could be, uh, and practicing at the same time. And I think this is uh, a time to get to know the steroids and what they can really do, if they can do anything. But even more so, uh, to do what I do even without music. And I can, right? It's not a concert. I don't need a show to be like my crutch. Uh, I can honestly, I, I can speak hours. We'll keep it short, you know, an hour and a half, maybe an hour. I promised the doctor an hour. He said, Yuri, you know, cancel it. It's not worth it. Even just talking, you destroy your vocal cords. This is the end of the tour. I have four more dates, right? Tomorrow in Virginia, then Raleigh, Chapel Hill, and that's it. But why, you know, these past, these last four, and, and uh, you know, a, a, a lovely, you know, uh, congregation and, and, and people in, this, in this, this community came out. A fantastic, you know, uh, temple or shrine or, or sanctuary. And for me not to be able to sing, uh, but for me to come out and for you to come out, I'm convinced that uh, it's time to try uh, to, uh, just through spoken word, present my program, and I can. Uh, music is nice, That's, it's more convincing, it's more maybe entertaining, I don't like the word entertainment. Uh, it feels good, but it's not the same type of show or entertainment or theater. Uh, what we do is, is uh, songs of truth, songs of morality, th songs of love, uh, songs of uh, a Christian philosophy, right? Philosophy of being a good person and doing good things. And if I'm going to take talk for hours, I need to hydrate my voice. Uh, but <clears throat> now the question is, you know, why am I here today? Uh, and the program is specifically for you, right? Not just Ukrainians, but Americans uh, who uh, don't like what Putin's doing. They don't like the Moscow Empire. Uh, they hate the Moscow Empire. You know, we have every reason. Uh, but uh, what you can do even here in New Jersey, right, uh, to defend Ukraine. And I'll start by saying we have this attitude that, you know, to fight Putin, you have to have lots of cannons and guns, maybe some nuclear bombs, right? It has to be a fair fight. But there's another way. And when Jesus tells St. Peter, if you're going to live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. And some other philosophy. Uh, Jesus doesn't talk too much about war. King David does. <laughs> you can read the Psalms. We did during these, these three months. Uh, but I think uh, what Jesus would say is whatever you do, uh, do it out of love. Yes, we have the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. But the Christian philosophy is whatever you do, do it out of love. And I've taken that in asking questions eight, eight years, you know, uh, what's the right way to get rid of the Muscovites from our territory? And the answer is, uh, if you're going to shoot, shoot out of love, right? In all, in all seriousness, right? Don't shoot out of hate. If you do anything out of hate, it's a sin. If you kill out of hate, it's a big sin, right? So. Think about your family, your children, your wives, your country. And if you pull the trigger, shoot at the legs. They don't need those. <laughs> and if you can't, put them in jail. Uh, 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 kill them. Uh, but do it out of love for Ukraine. Uh, do it for the love of your enemy. How are we going to help Russia become a good nation? You have to put them, as they, they say, on their knees, right? They have to be put in a box. They have to be de-armed. They have to be taught a lesson by force. They know force. And they won't respect you until you put them on their knees. They want that. They need that. And it's time for the older brother, or mother, you might say, Ukraine, uh, to dajte poradok Moskovsky imperia, and even more so, to dismantle that empire. It's not a good empire. It was never good. Ukrainians know very well. Uh, my ancestors, uh, they either fought or at some point had to flee. 
Now, I'm the first generation, if you can imagine, that can go home. My grandfather, my great-grandfather, my great-great-great-grandfathers, my ancestors, all of them, had they stayed home, they would have died because these were the most serious of Ukrainians. Uh, and uh, this is a big victory already that me and my family, uh, August 1st, will be home. Uh, but we live in a village. We're not in a big city, so there's no bombings in the village. It could happen. It could happen anywhere. Maybe if Putin says, oh, they're having a festival, we're going to bomb the festival. It's a possibility. August the 20th, 21st, uh, come to Krechkivka. Lots of music and singing and camping. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the philosophy is how do we defend Ukraine? And through these three months, I've realized uh, spirit is how you do good things. It's how you can even defend, physically defend, right? Uh, we have lots of examples, especially in the Old Testament. Isus Navin. How did he beat the Philistines? Uh, you know, he asked God to help, and God sent a gradi, right? The hail, the hot hail. <laughs> it happens. Or in Ukraine, when, you know, the Muscovites take the tanks across, you know, the spring, black earth, and the tanks don't go forward. They go down in the mud. <laughs> That's how God works. When we ask NATO to close the skies, it's a great idea. NATO, please help us. Western world, help us. They're doing so. Do even more. Uh, do everything you can. But uh, to ask God to close the skies, that's also uh, not less important. I would say more important. Uh, when Jesus tells us how to be saved, you know, he's talking about our souls, right? Let's talk about our countries. Peace i molitva do spasinya. To be saved, you have to pray and you have to fast. When I'm talking about fasting, here I'm not talking about not eating meat on Friday. I'm talking about going out of your comfort zone and doing something for Ukraine. You could be donating money, you could be making, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, bulletproof vests or sewing the vests or making sandwiches or making cards, right? Children just making cards. You could say, how is that going to help anything? It helps everything because the child through that card, through that good, you know, positive love energy, it gets into the card and it goes to Ukraine. And the, the, the soldiers who read those, those uh, listivki, those, you know, those uh, uh, you know, uh, drawings, the spirit goes into their souls. And they may be in a time when they're afraid, maybe they're afraid of dying, uh, but that's the thing that keeps them going. So spirit, God, will put the Moscow Empire in their place, but only through our help. So we need God to finish this. And an interesting philosophy, during the second Maidan, I've been to all revolutions, I call this the third revolution, 3.0. I don't give so much focus to the negative parts of the war. There's lots of death and destruction, there's uh, terrible things. But through these three months, I've been a witness to the positive things. And there is uh, 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 several sources who have, uh, over you know, the past 40 years, suggested to Ukrainians, God does not want to destroy Ukraine. He doesn't want anybody to let them. What is happening? Uh, and there were several people. Vernihor was one, I think a small girl in uh, Zavarnitsk, Zavarnitsk who saw a vision of, of the, the Virgin Mary. I think even in Fatima, uh, when uh, the Virgin Mary appeared to the, to the children uh, and said, pray for Russia. Uh, uh, we have some ideas that God is not letting Moscow destroy Ukraine. God is actually uh, training Ukraine. Ukraine is being tempered by all these vyprobovania, uh, uh, right? All these trials and tribulations. God is keeping Ukraine, uh, uh, is preparing Ukraine, not destroying, right? You might say, what is Ukraine? It's a third world country. There's nothing good there, you know, there's corruption, there's, you know, what do they have? These people don't have a future. That's what you think. But what's really going in the genes over these hundreds of years is we may look poor. Uh, some people may look stupid. Some people may look like alcoholics and, and, and corrupt, uh, you know, whoever they are. But there's something in those Ukrainians, and I know it's, it's in me, I feel it, that these 
trials and tribulations for me over the past 23 years. Moscow isn't destroying me. This stress isn't destroying my nerves. I've had some close calls, but I know I'm becoming a better person. That's why I'm in Ukraine. Uh, and it's not just me. Uh, you ask, how is Ukraine you know, beating back the Moscow forces? It's incredible. We don't have such a great army. We don't have you know, this, this whole fighting spirit like the Muscovites. You know, that's in their blood, this whole Mongol. Uh, I don't want to say anything bad about the Mongols. This whole warfare, cult of war. Uh, but what it is, we Ukrainians don't know ourselves. Uh, we don't know what we're capable of. But we're finding out. And you give a country that has been slaved, a free country in Eastern Europe, right, uh, uh, the Kozak state, you give, you put that free country, right, the first, one of the first democratic nations in Europe, when Western Europe was in their feudalist phase, you give them 300 years of slavery, you give them some incredible poets like Skovoroda, Shevchenko, Les Ukrainka, Ivan Franco, and you prepare that nation who's fighting, constantly fighting just to be Ukrainian, right? And finally, you give them 30 years of freedom. Give them 40 years, right? Like the Israelites. It took 40 years for them to get out of that slave mentality. But when they got free, they went back home and they created a home. I don't want to talk so much about Israel. I don't know so much about Israel, but I know about Ukraine. And I know what's going on now is something very similar. We're returning home. We're opening our eyes. We're opening our hearts. We're getting to know God. We're getting to know Ukraine. Uh, all these things which are happening, they happen at a much faster pace during war or revolution, let's say. Both of the revolutions, I noticed, it's a study, that when you're sitting at home, you don't change so much. You don't develop so much. Maybe a little bit, I hope. But during the revolutions, it, God has you on the fast track. And I've seen incredible things during the revolutions and what it's done for the nation. But the third revolution, Maidan Trikrapkanul, that's not the, just the Maidan. All Kiev becomes the Maidan. Now we truly have a free nation. We didn't have that for 30 years. We thought we did. We were free on paper. That's not freedom. Until you get ready to die for freedom, only then you truly have it and you truly know you have it. So, what's going to happen in the future is very positive things. And when ABC uh, called me several days before the bombing, I think two or three days, they said, okay, Yurko, we heard that you evacuated your family, you stayed in Ukraine, you know, tell us about how your wife le let you stay in Ukraine. I said, there's no story there. She told me very simply, I believe in your mission, I love you, and come, come to, to, to Raleigh soon. Uh, that's it. But what I would really like to tell the American people is what I'll tell you now, is that Ukraine will have a war, a big war. Ukraine will be victorious. Ukraine will put the Moscow Empire back. And Ukraine will be a, a, the best example of a free country in the new world. And I hope that Ukraine will be a good example to America and other free countries how a nation can get together and unify, like we have in Ukraine, East and West. In America, we have the left and the right, right? That's the obstacle for America. And uh, as I told ABC in World War II, you had Western Europe and the fascists, and you have Eastern Europe, the so-called communists. Uh, what happened? You have a polarization. People were divided. They fought against each other. Uh, huge destruction. World War II. You know, you've seen the movies. Uh, but as I told ABC, I hope Ukraine will teach America a lesson. Don't let it happen. Don't let them label you party A or party B or party L or party R. Uh, it's baloney, right? Uh, political parties are not to hate your neighbors. <laughs> you know, in the television, what they didn't like is that they're the media, and maybe they didn't like the comparison of you know, the fascists, the communists, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, I'll tell you the truth, I don't like any of the parties. <laughs> you wanna know the truth? Uh, but I thank both parties and everybody who voted for your best candidate, especially 
for each of the parties supporting Ukraine. That's, that's the way it should go. Uh, and that's a very positive step. Uh, so I will do some music because I will lose my voice even just talking. Uh, fantastic microphone. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, so uh, I'll talk about the, the music, the instruments. For three months, playing music during the war, it seems very strange. Uh, but as I was telling uh, Jing just in the interview, I was prepared, right? My whole life has been a preparation uh, to be able to do what I did these three months. Uh, and Jing says, well, why didn't you flee with your family? As my mom says, Yuri, we don't need another hero. Your children need a father. I have five children, right? The fifth daughter, Kvitoslava, was born two months ago, right? That's why I evacuated them. Uh, but uh, uh, when I realize that really the work that I do, I mean, I do what I like, I'm a musician. I see these instruments in photographs and books. My uncle, Yurko Mashinsky in Denver, told me the tor Torban. I said, I don't know the Torban, but here it is in a book, uh, but as a musician, I don't wanna you know, just read books. I want the instruments to have them, to play them. Uh, so this has been a lifetime's work to where today you can actually see uh, and hear these instruments. Uh, and it isn't just a musical tradition, it's a spiritual tradition. And now I know it's a spiritual tradition specifically geared to defend Ukraine, keep Ukraine Ukrainian, not Russian, right, not Muscovite, uh, and keep Ukraine wholesome, healthy, and good. Uh, so I, you know, as I told Jing, I couldn't betray my profession betray my work, betray myself, betray my country, and betray my children. Somebody said, you know, what do you want for your children? I want the best children possible. That's why I have Ukrainian children. American children are nice, don't get me wrong. I was an American child, I'm still, a, I'm not 48, I feel like 25, I'm still a child, maybe. I'm doing very, you know, not, not very, I don't know. But I want my children to have a country. People in the diaspora everywhere, I've seen, you know, thousands over these past five years, and people in the, the sieges, I say, right, the, the New Jersey siege, the siege the fortress, where Ukrainians had to flee and had to make a home for themselves, World War II. Who fled the Nazis, the communists in World War II? Raise your hand, anybody? Your parents? Were you, were you born in, in New Jersey? Or were you born in, in Europe or Ukraine? No, Devin Narodilisa, talk. A Devin Narodilisa. Kiri. Kivet. Okay. Okay. That says Zakiv. Ah, okay, okay. So in Western Ukraine. Okay. Ah, Tom, okay. Kivsi. Fantastic. Okay, 32 kilometers from Lviv. So Western Ukraine. So what's interesting is that one person fled, you know, fled uh, the Muscovite Empire, uh, like my grandparents. Okay. <laughs> no, I have a difficulty with my voice. <laughs> so basically, uh, what's interesting is that he fled the communists and came to New York, New Jersey uh, to, to, as a refugee, right, as my grandparents. My mom was born in Hoboken. Uh, I was born here, my mom was born in Hoboken. Uh, but what we have is, it's a traditional uh, a theme of, of Ukraine to go abroad and create a siege, Dunaisky siege, New Jersey siege, right? So this is a fortress, uh, a diaspora kind of a, you know, a place for where it is sanctuary, where you can live. And uh, for me, all those people in the diaspora, they work hard, they make money, they buy nice cars and houses, fantastic. But you can't buy your country. All of them, everyone I've talked to, I can tell they, they'd like to do what they do, but do it at home. Because if you're a Ukrainian and you're without Ukraine, it's gonna be hard. Maybe Americans can live in. I think Americans, everybody, everybody from any country has the same situation. Uh, but for me, I decided to live without compromise. 
and I decided, and I have premonitions, right, that Ukraine is going to be the place for my children. And for me, 23 years to be working there, the best years of my life, creating ethno ensembles and musical projects. I've done a lot of music, the CDs out there, you can see what I really do. Uh, and to give all that to Putin, that's not right. And the folks in Ukraine who are fighting and risking their lives, you might say, why are they risking their lives? Why don't they just come to America or to Europe? You know, there's very nice benefits. You know, refugee status, it's a great time to, to be abroad. And for me, it's a great time to come and have concert tours and sing songs. Uh, but a person who doesn't have any money, doesn't really have a future, doesn't, you know, have the prospect of ever having a car, maybe they'll have a village house, maybe they'll be able to plant some potatoes. You might say, why are they risking their lives? And do you know why? Because uh, in the world, for Ukrainians, there's a lot against us, right? That's how it is. Moscow's always working against us. But if after everything we've gone through these past 30 years, we would let Moscow take our country away, take that away, at that moment we realized what we have maybe been taking for granted for those 30 years. Maybe we should have worked harder, but it's okay, it's not too late and over our dead bodies will Moscow take away our freedom. That's what we have in Ukraine, and that's why they can't take us, because we're freedom lovers. And you know why I live in Ukraine? Not just because it's my ancestral home, because I'm free. Uh, I have a wonderful life. Slava uh, Krina. So So that's, that's what's happening. Uh, we really do know what freedom is and, uh, you know, we'd like a better country. You know, we're working on it, we're doing what we can. Uh, we can always do more, everybody can do more. But uh, to go back to Soviet, to Moscow occupation, genocide, this is enough to risk your head, you know, as Jesus did. Be a good example, risk your life for your friends and your family. That's what we're dealing with. It's the crucifixion of a country. The same thing Jesus went through on the cross when his mother said, Jesus, you know, come down. Why are you going to let them destroy you? You're God. You, doesn't, you don't have to go through this. And Jesus says, no. It's for the, the, un, the people who don't believe. I'm going to show them that I am God. I will resurrect. Uh, and they can resurrect. And they can have a good example. That's what's happening. That's what Putin wants Ukraine for. Uh, he is the Antichrist. He wants to destroy us because he uh, has been trying to take Ukraine for years and he can't. He can take Belarus, he can take over Georgia for several weeks in certain parts, but he can't get Ukraine. Uh, so now in his old age, he's just going all out and, uh, uh, and he's losing. Uh, he's really lost, let's be honest. Uh, but we have 20% of our country to, to liberate. So it's not over. Right? Don't turn off the Ukrainian channel that's part of your news. Uh, and that's what we're here today for. The worst is maybe over. But those people who defended and saved Ukraine for the past four or five months, they're the ones who are dying in the East. And why are they dying? Because the wars continue on. Continuing on, it's a Myasorub. It's a slaughterhouse on both sides. But the Ukrainians who've been fighting for five months, uh, you know, as somebody said, they're dying. What can we do? Uh, and what do we do? We do what we can. We pray. We ask God, how can we help? He'll tell you how to help, you know, specifically. And, uh, and get out of your daily routine, your comfort zone, uh, and uh, do something which, which, which can help, anything, anything. So I'm gonna play some music so I don't lose my voice, but I'm not gonna sing. Can I sing? Not really.
Yes. 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 Uh, the Kobzars were spirit, blind spiritual singers. And. Hold on, just try to do That's good. No, you can use that for the instrumental. Oh, good, good. Oh, good, good. That does it. Oh. And so the Kobzars, these were blind spiritual singers. Uh, they had a, a specific repertoire, usually hymns, right? Uh, church hymns, uh, but also epic. epic uh, songs, which we also call Zaporozhian hymns, Zaporozhki psalmi, <clears throat> uh, but also uh, historic songs, uh, songs of uh, the true history of Ukraine, not the Moscow censored version. Uh, so uh, these blind spiritual singers weren't, music weren't just musicians. You might not even call them musicians. Uh, these were missionaries. They would travel village to village. You can imagine uh, St. Paul, right? St. Peter and St. Paul. Uh, these were apostles, right? These were missionaries. Uh, Jesus said, go into the world and tell people the truth about uh, Jesus, Christianity, uh, love. And uh, the Kobzars, as much as I understand, they were very much missionaries or apostles, but they were blind. Uh, can you imagine going through hostile territory, Moscow occupied Eastern Ukraine, a blind man uh, supporting Ukraine, supporting Christianity uh, in, in that type of, you know, in those years from 1700 to 1933 when they were all killed. Uh, these were very serious missionaries. Uh, so the songs they sung uh, were basically sacred texts, uh, but even if a Kobzar lost his voice, he could still tell the truths. So what I'm doing, just even speaking, this is the tradition. But I can play, my fingers aren't sick. So uh, I'll play some improvisations. Uh, and, uh, most of these songs are text-based, so this is kind of difficult, but I'll do my best. This is called the Bandura, uh, traditional folk Kobzar Bandura. Uh, the Bandura most of you may have seen. Anybody ever seen a Bandura? Raise your hand. Okay, if you're Ukraine, you probably saw a Bandura, but not this type of Bandura. Some of you may have. Uh, the Bandura most Ukrainians know is called the modern Bandura, Suchasna Bandura. It weighs about five or ten times more than this one, has metal strings, has modulating mechanisms, you can even play Bach or Beethoven. But on that instrument, you can't play the Kobzar repertoire. Uh, and why is that? Why don't Ukrainians know the traditional Bandura? Because the Soviets erased it from our collective memory. Even today, a soldier on the front getting ready to die for his country says, what is that instrument? I don't know that instrument. Uh, so, uh, the idea is to bring back uh, the, uh, the most serious music and hoping that will bring back Ukraine with the spirit embedded in these old songs. We have old emotions, the emotions of Shevchenko and Mazep and Skovroda. Wouldn't that be what Ukraine needs to open its eyes and say, oh, that's who we are. So that's what, these are improvisations to give my voice a rest. Listen to some music.
maybe if I start to sing, maybe I'll have my voice back. I don't. the bandura. <clears throat> uh, we have other instruments. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the instruments. Uh, the <clears throat> uh, it's called a bandura. It's, it's mostly like a zither or a psaltery, you might call it. Uh, uh, a harp, really kind of like a harp. Uh, but this is what we call a kobza. Uh, and the kobza is very similar to a bandura. In fact, the two terms, kobza and bandura, were traditionally synonymous. You could call that instrument a bandura or a kobza, right? Uh, but uh, today we see that we have, in general, you know, lots of different types, you know, harp guitars, similar instruments. And because we have three main categories uh, and we have three main terms, the kobza, the bandura, and the turban, today we differentiate. So if you just say the word kobza, you know exactly what we're talking about, right? Or a turban or a bandura. Uh, so the kobza uh, uh, is similar to a bandura, but the difference is on the kobza, you can see we have less strings, uh, but uh, the main difference is that the kobza, uh, you can actually fret the melody on the neck, right? You can play melodies while fretting. Uh, the bandura, you heard, I can fret the basses, but those are only basses. So the kobza uh, is more like a lute, Right, it is a lute. In fact, uh, a synonym to the word kobza would have been Zaporozhka lutnya, right? The lute of the Zaporozhian Cossacks, uh, the Cossacks from Zaporizhia, or the Ukrainian Cossacks. Uh, and the most similar instrument to the kobza, uh, the Versai kobza, the last player of the kobza was a stop Versai. This is a similar instrument to what he played. Uh, the most similar instrument is actually not the lute, uh, but uh, the oud, right? The original lute, uh, the Arabic, or uh, even more close to the, the Turkish oud, which is also an unfretted lute. Now, the difference between the oud and the kobza is that we have a monoxal construction. It's not staved like a lute, uh, because this was much simpler to make in a rural setting from a, a maker who wasn't a professional. That's made out of one piece of maple. That's a big piece of maple, right? Uh, uh, but the ouds would have been made with small strips of bent wood, like a boat, basically to uh, save, save wood and to uh, have a, a lighter instrument. Uh, so, uh, but the difference, the main difference between the kobza and the oud is that on the kobza we have treble strings. They all have treble strings, right? Uh, something about Ukrainian string instruments uh, Ukrainians like these harp-like strings, uh, so I'll demonstrate uh, some of Versailles playing. As I said, the only music we have for this instrument is from the last Kobzar, the most renowned Kobzar. He was a good player and singer, uh, Ostap Versailles. Uh, and he's important that uh, uh, we have notes for his instrument, right? And from notes you can, you can play his repertoire. We have the text he sang. Uh, and this all was made possible because of an early Ukrainian ethnomusicologist, or folklorist as we say. Uh, he was also a pianist and conductor and culture activist, uh, Mikola Lysenko. Because of his early folklore work, he, he had an excellent ear. He didn't have a dictaphone. He notated note for note the Dumas, right, the epic songs uh, and the dances and everything. So these are examples of Versailles playing. Again, I'm not going to sing. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to try. I could sing in a bass voice, but that's not the same. We'll see. So this is Ostap Versailles, and some of uh, his uh, dances, some of his hymns he would play. Uh, and I'll also add uh, some Kozak Baroque, uh, the cant about Adam and Eve, but without text. You know the story. Um, and, uh, and a little bit of a Duma. Uh, so you hear all these different genres. And Versailles died about 1890, 
So this, these works would have been collected maybe 1880. Uh, and it's interesting that actually, uh, uh, another story, Lysenko took Versailles to, th to see the Tsar. Now, what were they doing to, to, with the Tsar? Uh, they went for cultural diplomacy. They wanted to prove to the Tsar that Ukraine is not Russia. Because if Ukraine was Russia, Kobzar music would not sound like it does. And you'll hear, you'll hear what I'm we're talking about. A lot of Ukrainians even say, this doesn't sound Ukrainian, it sounds Jewish, it sounds Arabic, it sounds Turkish. Uh, well, we forgot what we sounded like from Russification, from Europeanization, uh, modernization, uh, but this is how Versailles sounded. And actually, Lysenko write, wrote a paper, a research paper, a referat, uh, basically uh, comparing uh, you know, uh, Ukrainian songs to Russian songs. Uh, and and you know, uh, as they appeared in Versailles playing, this was completely not Russian music. Uh, and what Lysenko wanted was autonomy. Convinced the Tsar, and the Tsar had an audience with him, right? He, the Tsar listened to Versailles. He even liked Versailles. He said, fantastic, he even gave him a snuff box. I don't remember which Tsar it was, but because of that snuff box, uh, Versailles, when he was playing back in his native Poltava, when the police would come to destroy his instruments, he said, don't touch me. I know the Tsar, and the Tsar is a fan. <laughs> <laughs> so it came in handy. Uh, but the idea was uh, cultural diplomacy, right? Using music, using musicians, in the spirit of the musicians, uh, to melt the Pharaoh's heart. <laughs> so So if anybody's heard of Shevchenko, you'll notice he doesn't paint that bandura because it didn't exist. This was the bandura of Shevchenko's time, and this is how it would have sounded. So when he writes Kobzar, he's talking about this instrument and this sound. <laughs>
And again, this is very, very new to me just to play instrumental improvisations and show. But you know, this is a good, good way to know the instruments uh, without, without vocal. Uh, because again, the songs that I play, they're text-based, right? A lot of, these aren't compositions necessarily. You could say that's a composition, an improvisation, uh, with, with themes which, which I, I usually play. Uh, but uh, it's not so bad. I think it's good we didn't cancel the event today. I feel very good. I would have loved to sing, but uh, I can tell you, tell, tell you about what I would sing. Uh, we had a, uh, you know, I'll explain this next instrument. It's what we call a torban. Can everybody say torban? It's not a torba, it's not a bag. It's not a turban. It's not a Muslim headdress. It's a Ukrainian Baroque lute. Uh, and you might say, wow, where did this instrument come from? We don't even know this instrument. It's a Ukrainian instrument, are you kidding me? Maybe it's Russian, maybe it's Polish. No, uh, act, the, the invention of the instrument was actually uh, around the time of the Cossack Baroque. So this is maybe 1700, uh, maybe a bit before uh, the question of the dates. Uh, but the creator of the Torban was actually a Polish man, a Polish monk, uh, brother to Ligovsky. And he took a very expensive uh, Baroque lute. You know, these things cost, you know, I think today like $10,000. If you can find a maker who'll make them. Uh, I don't sell them for 10,000, I don't sell them at all. I don't sell my instruments at all. I don't get into commerciality, but expensive stuff. And uh, he actually got a, a, a prize uh, from the Kaiser, from the Austrian uh, Kaiser, I don't remember which one, uh, for his Liuto Tulikovsky. Uh, but interesting that the instrument became very popular in Ukraine. And at a time where uh, Ukraine, left bank, or, or I'm sorry, right bank Ukraine was part of the Polish Empire, Right, or uh, Pospolita, uh, uh, Ukrainians, uh, you know, did a lot for that empire, uh, and uh, one of the things they did was to play this uh, Luto Tulikovsky. Uh, but it got to the point where the Poles themselves started calling the Torban uh, Torban Ruski, Torban, or the translation Torban Ukrainski. Right, the word Ruski uh, in Polish means Ukrainian. We are the Rusins, right? Uh, Russia is a term which is actually stolen from us. Ukraine is Russia, really. It all gets mixed up, right? Uh, when Peter the Not-So-Great took over the Cossack uh, government, the Hetmanate, uh, they were called, do you know what they were called? Moscovia Tataria. No Russia, no Rus, and everybody knew very well it was a lie. No, don't even try it. But after he took over Eastern Ukraine, right, the free Eastern Ukrainian government, then he said, aha, now we are Rus, we are Russia. So the name of their empire, Russia, it's, it was even, it's, not, it's even a fake. That's why I call them the Muscovites, the Muscovite empire. Let's call them who they are. Uh, but we don't say that we're Russia, we say that we were Rus, right? Uh, we have some Rusins, people who recall their ancestry from Rus. Even today, there's Ruthenians, Rusins. Uh, and uh, what was Rus? This is this Middle Age empire, a Ukrainian empire, uh, where uh, uh, we were, uh, I think, at 12, 1200, the Kiev was the largest city in Europe. Very influential. Anybody see the Viking serial with Ragnar Loxbroth? And when they come to Kiev, <laughs> so uh, it was a big empire. Uh, but uh, Moscow wanted to, of course, you know, take that empire over, and there was lots of kind of conflicts, not just with uh, Kiev and Rus and, and Moscovia, uh, with uh, Yuri the long-armed Dolgoruki, uh, who sacked and burned Kiev, I think, three times. Uh, but uh, this version of history, even when I went to East Carolina University, we read a textbook that said, at some point, everybody in Kiev packed up and went to Moscow. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. Does that happen? What a mass, you know, migration up there. That's not how it happens. Uh, you know, they were, they were part of Rus, you know, a far off part. <coughs> but they needed a history. They needed to convince the world and to convince themselves that they are part of this grand tradition of, you know, Rus. They started calling themselves Russia. But Ukrainians say, uh-uh, we are Kiev and Rus. 
and you are not. You are Moscovia Tataria. <laughs> uh, we uh, were not you know, created from the Mongolian horde who, who you know, asked them tribute for many years. Uh, we had our own government, our own way of, you know, our own culture, very cultured you know, folks like Anna uh, Yaroslavovna, who was married to some place in, you know, out there in France, out in, the, out in the boondocks, right, where her husband signed his name with an X, and she wrote very elegantly, you know, in this middle age, you know, uh, font, uh, kind of a scropis, kind of handwriting, uh, uh, Anna Yaroslavovna. So, uh, the Torban uh, was an instrument uh, created not for folk songs. It's not a folk instrument. The Bandura Kobza are, but the Torban was made for Baroque music. When we talk Baroque, we first think of Bach. We see the harpsichord, uh, we see the organ uh, as instruments which Bach played. Instruments which exa exist at the same time as the Baroque lutes, even in Germany. Uh, the Ukrainian bar Baroque lute has treble strings, pristrinki, making it uh, a very special Ukrainian instrument. But again, this instrument is made for playing very difficult uh, Baroque polyphonic lute textures, where the thumb plays one uh, line, one voice, the bass. Uh, these fingers play the melody, and even you have fugues, four part fugues on a string instrument. This is nuts. <laughs> That's why the harpsichord took over the lute. But in Ukraine, the harpsichord didn't take over the lute because the lute, the, our lute, our torban, our Baroque lute, uh, existed until 1917 when Russia said, oh, this is not good. If Ukrainians are playing those things, uh, they don't look so simple, do they? Uh, and even in Catherine the not so greats court, a lot of their culture was imported from Ukraine. You have a lot of Ukrainians from Hluchovsky, Shkola, right, Borgyansky, uh, even Skovrada, a lot of folks were imported to, to sing and to make music. Uh, but Catherine very much realized that this Torban being imported from Ukraine doesn't look good. So she banned all Torban playing. But even so, Russia accepted the Torban as their own instrument. They had a different tradition. The Ukrainian Torbanists were uh, very, usually very educated, the intelligentsia, uh, even the hetmans, the Kozatsky Starshin, the, the officers, uh, the Kozak officers or generals, uh, even professional Torbanists like Timofey Biloradsky. Uh, but the Russian tradition of playing the Torban was kind of like cabaret, something in the bar. Uh, we don't, I don't want to demean them, but they have their own you know, tradition of the Torban. And uh, recently for our festival, I invited uh, a, a lute player from Moscow, from the conservatory. We have a, a, a festival called Dravorod Kobzarsko, or the Kobzar family tree, or maybe even the Kobzar woodstock. <laughs> Interesting translation. Wood, Dravo, stock, cast, uh, rodu, family tree, it, it worked. Uh, and I invite lots of people, even from uh, Crimea, Crimean Tatar music. Uh, my friend uh, from uh, Przemek, uh, Ostrowski from Poland, the player of the lira, and I invited this girl from Moscow. My friend said, Yuri, what are you doing? Are you taking Putin money, you know, to do some funny business? I said, there's a difference when Putin sends somebody to our festival and when we invite them ourselves. And this lady, fantastic. She's a fantastic lute player. She's playing European music uh, all over Europe, first class. And I asked her, do you know about the Ukrainian Torban? She said, no, I've never heard of this. I said, look at what we have in Ukraine. She says, wow, fantastic. I'd love to come to your festival. And I'm not coming for money. I didn't talk about honorarium. But how could she come to Ukraine? She could only hitchhike, right? And she's, I think, I don't know, maybe 30 years old from Moscow, hitchhiking to Ukraine, a country which is at war with Russia. This is last, last June. I tell my friends, listen, she's risking her head in her career. To, to support our culture and get to know Ukrainian culture. I said, she's one of us. They said, Yuri, it doesn't look good. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. And I told Marina Belova, maybe a later date, my, my company isn't ready for that step. I do lots of experiments. Uh, but just to, to talk about that, my program today is not anti-Russian. Uh, if anybody has a reason to hate Russia and Russians, it's me. 
They killed everybody, all my family. The ones who stayed in, in occupied territory were killed. Uh, the ones who got out had to fight. Uh, they were either, you know, Cossack uh, officers uh, like Petrovci, like my great grandfather. My grandfather, who tried to work in the Soviet system, is, is, a, is a teacher of law, but he said it's all based on bribes. My, my, uh, my Cossack my ancestors from the Poltava region, they did what they could, but they didn't want to be slaves. They had to take off to the Dunaisky siege, right, in uh, Ismail, where my grandmother was born. But I've realized one of the main moments of my program, how to defend Ukraine, and listen to me very careful. Don't do anything out of hate, right? Now we have a trap. I call it a Putin trap. And Putin wants us all to fall in it, not just Ukraine, but America and the West. He says that we want to take over Russia. He says that we Ukrainians are fascists and racists and terrible people. We even eat our children, he says. <coughs> when they come to Ukraine, they rape and they pillage. And I'm not just talking about the women and the children. They eat the dogs. It's on a different level. Hitler didn't eat the dogs. Right? He's competing with Hitler and Stalin and winning because he is the Antichrist today. But what he wants is terror. He wants hate from us. He wants us to hate him in Russia. <coughs> He's convinced his people that we do hate them. But <coughs> Russia, before the war, who cares? You know, Do we Americans hate Russia before the war? Now when the war is going on, we have a reason to hate them, right? Uh, the truckers are putting Ukrainian flags in their truck stops. It's fantastic. I cry in the truck stop next to the sticker that says, you can have my gun when you take my cold, dead hands off of it. And underneath I see Slav Ukraina. That's the America I love. <laughs> and, uh, but the idea is not to fall in the trap because when we start hating them, then we become closer to them, right? He's the Antichrist. Uh, Satan, evil, hate is evil. So what do we do with Russia? We have to put them back on the banks of the Moscow River, right? Uh, their empire needs to be compromised. I would even say, let China take a rather big piece. <laughs> Maybe they'll take, I'm, I'm sure they'll take better care of it than the Muscovites do, especially out there, after, you know, east of the Urals. But he wants hate, do you know why? Because he wants escalation. Do you know what escalation is? It's not just when you have guns, more guns, war, bigger war. It's when you have hate and you have more hate and when both sides hate. The war right now, it's not an equal war, right? As somebody said, this is a holy war. Russia is fighting out of evil pursuits. The West is defending Ukraine out of uh, pursuits of love and, and, and saving your country, your, 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 your fellow man. So let's not give Putin what he wants. Let's not hate them. Let's help them. This is something Putin doesn't expect. Does Putin want help? He doesn't want help. He wants to take over the world. We have a prophet. Uh, his name was Ver uh, Musi Vernihora. He uh, had some... Oh, no, 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 no. Baba Vanga. Raise your hand if you've heard of Baba Vanga. Right? The, the Romanian, was she Romanian? She was Romanian prophetess. And she would, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, prophetize to some of the Soviet leaders like Brezhnev. So Brezhnev drives down his big Soviet car to Romania, and he says, Oh, Baba Vanga, zdrastvui, skazete pajalastva, kak eta budit, valiki rasia. So he asked this Romanian, tell us the future, how will it be in the future? So she says, uh, it'll be very glorious. But she's speaking Romanian. She doesn't know Russian. So some things are lost in translation. <laughs> so, you know, Brezhnev says, you know, what'll happen? He says, uh, there will be a huge empire, right? Uh, a big Russia, as they translate it. And they'll have, a, a, just like we had the Grand Prince uh, Vladimir Bolshoi, right? <laughs> what do they call him? I don't know. The Grand Prince uh, Vladimir, they call this in Russia. Uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages, he baptized Ukraine, uh, accepted Christianity. So it will be in the future. There will be a, a big Russia, 
and there will be another Vladimir, and he will be the leader of the, of the, of the world or something to that effect. So what happens is Putin very well believes in Baba Vanga, but he got the wrong translation. <laughs> How it should have been translated is uh, the glory of Volodymyr Veliki, the Ukrainian Grand Prince of, of 988, and the next world leader from not Russia, but from the new Kiev Rus, the new Rus Ukraine, uh, and the next, not Vladimir Putin, but Volodymyr Zelensky. <laughs> now, I don't know. I don't know if Volodymyr Zelensky will be the one. Maybe she was talking about him. I think it's a good possibility. So Putin got it wrong. <laughs> you have a question? No, just we have about 10 minutes before we got to wrap it up. So oh, fantastic. I made it, and I still have my voice. <laughs> you have a question, please? Very different thing. <laughs> oh, I call them Moscovia. Uh, Moscow. Yes, yes, we are Rus. <laughs> yes, and we'll see in the future, maybe. We will have, there's a question, will we go to Europe? Maybe we don't need Europe. Maybe we'll have a new, a new uh, union with Lithuania, with Poland, maybe with Turkey, maybe with England. Uh, but uh, we're not going to be on the periphery. We are the free world. <laughs> uh, and uh, we are giving the world a very direct message about what freedom really is. Oh, yes, yes. So, uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Huh, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, yes. So Shevchenko got it right. They're not Russia, or Russia, or Rus. They're Moscovia. Let's call them who they are. Uh, let's not spread fake information, right? So the Torban, I talked about it. This will be an improvisation. Uh, and the first song I heard in the Bandura, uh, certainly you know it too. Uh, I learned about uh, Ukrainian music and the Kobzar tradition uh, through uh, uh, another genre, we call it the Bandura Chorus. Uh, and if anybody knows in Cleveland, Detroit, all over the diaspora, the central organization of the Ukrainian diaspora was the Ukrainian Bandura's, Bandura Chorus uh, dedicated to the memory of Taras Shevchenko. I heard the chorus through recordings. My grandfather collected them, he took, my mother took them home. She played it for her children. And this is the first song I heard on the Bandura ever. But I'll play it on the Torban, and I sing the song, uh, and it's the lyrics of the text, the poetry of Shevchenko. But I won't sing because nothing comes out. So uh, this will be an improvisation on the melody of uh, Vasil Yemets, of Staya Kamada, the clouds are rising. And what I'll, I would be singing about, I'll tell you the text, uh, that the clouds are rising, the black clouds uh, from the Crimean region, one cloud, another cloud from across the, the field, maybe from the north of Kiev. Uh, is this a prophetic work? Yes. Uh, and Shevchenko compares Ukraine to a child. Uh, 
anybody see the, the photo on Facebook of the child crossing to the, into Poland with his teddy bear, his candy, and the look on his face? That's what I think about when I play this. That's what Shevchenko uh, compares Ukraine to. He says that's our fate, right? A free people being put into slavery, uh, crying as a child, worrying, no one, nowhere to, to run to, nowhere to flee to. Where are the parents? Where is Daddy America? Where is Mother Europe? Uh, and Europe and America say, well, we don't know you. We know uh, the Russian Empire. Maybe Ukraine, maybe you're separatist. We don't know. We don't know so much about your culture. We can't help. Uh, and the worst things Shevchenko writes about when the children of free Cossacks, right, the Kozatsky Diti, don't know God. Why is that important? Because the Cossacks, as we see defending Ukraine today, why are they there? They're not there for money. They're not there, you know, to, as mercenaries, uh, paid, you know, help or for some other motivation. They're there because they love their country, period. So this is the Torban, and I was playing this, one of, one of the most beautiful moments during the war. Uh, we went to military camps, military hospitals, and refugee centers, three months, me and three of my, of my, four of my students. That's a lot of concerts, hundreds of concerts in three months. How can you do that? Sometimes we had even as much as five concerts in one day in Zhitomir. How is that possible? And I say, in God, everything's possible. Uh, and we ask God, where should we go? And God tells us where to go. And when God decides we shouldn't go somewhere, he tells us the block post is closed because we don't want another American to be killed like the journalist from the New York Times. And I said, thank you, God. So that's what we do. And this is the song, but as I was uh, on Easter, Velikden, in Zaporizhia, uh, on the banks of Dnipro, a lady who invited us said, Shevchenko didn't want to be buried in Kaniv. He wanted to be buried in Zaporizhia, across from her park in uh, the, the, village, the village of Viskove. And she said, when he writes, bury me on the grave, it's not on his grave, it's on the Scythian grave, which is across from her park, across the river. And when he talks about the rapids, Porohe, he's not talking about Kaniv. There are no rapids there. It's in Zaporizhia. So she tells me this, and I'm playing these songs for refugees just getting out of eastern Ukraine, just crossing the front and looking for a place to stay. So she's donated her park. She has a fantastic house and, and everything. And as I'm presenting this next song, I said, let Shevchenko's spirit come from that side of the Dnipro to this side. <laughs> and I, lots of improvisation, lots of whatever comes in. So what happens at that time, a Ukrainian fighter jet flies over, and I have it on a recording, it's fantastic stuff, you can't make this stuff up. Well, I could, but, but I have the proof. So this is Stai uh, the the improvis improvised instrument version. Thank you. 
So thank you. I wish I could have sung the songs. It's, it's, it's all very new to just do instrumental songs. But I made it. I made it. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, we have time. I was going to say, before, hold on. So what I think we do is, it's the end of our formal program here, uh, we do want to encourage you to consider making a donation again for Razom. You'll find those tables in the back. People will gladly take your donations. Or you can go online. Uh, again, anything that's done through steepleconcerts.org today will be dedicated specifically for Razom. Um, and if you write a check, again, please mark it for Ukraine. Um, and you'll see that there are some CDs of Yuri's performances on the back table. Each of those CDs are $20. Um, um, so if you're interested in getting of those, again, see our attendance in the back. Um, and I think at this point we can thank Yuri. And if you'd like to ask him any questions, talk about these instruments that he built himself, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you uh, about them as well. So let's all thank Yuri for being here. And thanks, everybody. I'm sorry I lost my voice, but it's getting better. Maybe tomorrow. Uh, so thank you, thank you. I'm glad Slava Ukraini. I don't All right. And if also, if you haven't done so, a selfish, shameless plug here, check us out at steepleconcerts.org. This was not a Steeple Concerts event, but we have an entire season of great music that takes place right here at St. Paul's in downtown Westfield. Great musicians throughout the year. Go to steepleconcerts.org. We're about to announce our next season. So thank you all for coming out tonight. And if anybody wants to take a look at instruments, uh, Take a look now. You can even try to play them. Uh, so please, please, and thank you. God bless. God bless.